Amazing. Don't you love Christmas worship? It's the best. It's the best. Now, the funny thing is, with Christmas music, Christmas worship, is that we're so accustomed to these tunes that often with a lot of these songs, we really don't even know what we're saying, but we know the songs. We know the songs. They are locked in there. Way back in the, in the back of our minds, they're saved away, and then at Christmas time, we pull them out, and Gloria in excelsis Deo, right? When else would you ever say something like that? <laughs> it's there. It's locked away. My wife's favorite episode of Mr. Bean, kids, he's not a YouTuber, but you can find him on YouTube. Some of you remember Mr. Bean. My wife's favorite episode of Mr. Bean is when he's in church looking very uncomfortable during worship time, and he looks like this. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Right? Tell me you can't relate to some of these songs. <laughs> right? We know these songs, at least some of them. We know them, but what does it mean? Gloria in excelsis Deo. Does it really matter what it means? Is it something that if you knew what it means, you would really want to burst out in song over? Glory to God in the highest. That's what it means, literally. But what does it mean practically, realistically, for us? And what does it have anything to do with Christmas? My goal with us all as we study God's Word this evening is for us to see and embrace the fullness and the significance of these very words and that in them we find the fullness of life in Jesus, the true joy of Christmas. Now, there are several stories told in the Bible that describe the coming of Jesus and the revelation of who he is. The gospel writers, Matthew and Luke, begin with the birth narratives of baby Jesus. So many of these stories are very familiar to most of us. Mark begins with the ministry of Jesus. But the apostle John feels the need to go much further back. John goes all the way back to the beginning. And as a matter of fact, before the beginning, in his efforts to reveal to us who Jesus really is and why he has come. We're going to read the prologue or the intro of John's gospel in chapter 1 today. But before I do, it's important that you hear from John himself. Hear John, a personal friend and follower of Jesus, tell you why he has written this account. At the, at the conclusion of this gospel in, chap in chapter 20, John writes this. These things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That's his purpose for us in what we're about to read. Let me pray now, ask God to bless his word as we read it. And then the ushers will come forward and, and distribute Bibles. You can put your hand up if anyone would like to have a Bible in hand. If you don't have a Bible of your own, we would encourage you to keep this Bible. It's a gift from us to you. And uh, we'll also have Scripture up on the screen. Join me in a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, we look to you now. Enlighten the eyes of our hearts as we seek you in your word. Reveal to us marvelous things from your word. Lord, help us to see and behold the beauties of who you are and all that you've done for us, the significance of your coming for us. 
this Christmas as we read your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, John chapter 1, ushers are coming around with Bibles. You can put your hand up if you'd like to have one in hand. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. This is the fourth gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the New Testament, for those who are unfamiliar with navigating through a big book like this. John chapter 1, 1 through 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Big words here, packed with meaning and implication for all of us. Verse 1. First thing you'll notice is that the word is introduced with the same introduction as God in the opening verses of the Bible. Genesis 1.1, the first line in the first page of the Bible reads, In the beginning, God created The Word is just as important to John as God in the opening pages of Scripture. That's massive. John tells us the Word was both with God and was God. If you're scratching your heads, that's a good sign. Keep scratching and try to track with him. A couple things to note. In the same beginning of creation, that is, the Word was, already existed. Verse 2, He was in the beginning with God. The Word is a person. Verse 3, all things were made through Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. You like how John talks? He doubles up to ensure that what he's saying is very clear. He'll do it again and again throughout the gospel. But, Mommy, Daddy, who made God? Good question, darling. Nobody. God always existed. He is the maker of all. Good answer, Pops. Take that one with you. So what we see here is that Jesus is both God and distinct from God. Herein lies the historic Christian teaching of the Holy Trinity, that God is one, eternally existing in a loving unity of three Equally divine persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. One God, three persons. The Holy Spirit is revealed a bit later by Jesus in this gospel and quite extensively. The Word is creator of everything in the heavens and on earth. Interesting name, isn't it? The Word referring to God the Son. But think about it. It makes sense. When our words come out, they express our true inner selves, right? Our words reveal who we are, who we really are. What we say and how we say it reveals what's in our hearts. Similar with what's happening here. God reveals himself in creation. God speaks and God creates through his word. Let there be light. So what that means is that Jesus 
the word embodies the fullness of God's creative power and glory. We just sung about that. Glory and power forevermore. Something like that. I forgot. Sorry. We did just sing about that. I was looking at it. I was like, oh, we're about to. Anyway, at the end of of Jesus' ministry, consider this. Later in this gospel, chapter 17, Jesus prays to his father and says, Father, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. Now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. The Word was with God and was God. Altogether glorious. What does that mean? Glorious. Gloria. What's that? In the Bible, the word glory represents power, honor, beauty, and weight. The one who has glory in the Bible is full and weighty. Filled with what? This passage reveals to us the unique glories of the Word. What makes him so glorious? Verses 4 and 5. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness. The word is filled with life and light. He is a fountain for mankind. His glory radiates glory out from himself. Life and light. Now, what we see here is important. John is using terms that have a double meaning. In creation, the light of the sun cultivates life on earth, right? In contrast to darkness, which kills life. This is physical creation language for sure. All the beauties in all creation, all the glories of creation exist to bring honor and glory to God. The Apostle Paul writes a bit later in the book of of Romans chapter 1. He writes this, What can be known about God is plain to us because God has shown it to us. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So all of creation witnesses to the reality of the glory of God. Can you see that? Now you can make sense of the sunset. Now you can make sense of the impact of the peaks. You can make sense of the magnificence of the view, the expanse of the sky of chief importance in all creation to radiate the glory of God are humans, us, the only creatures in all creation made in his image with purpose to reflect his glory throughout the earth. That's the meaning and purpose of humanity in creation to reflect God's glory throughout the earth. Now, that being said, there's another meaning that's introduced here and mainly in view. As light produces and sustains life in the physical world, so there exists a kind of light that produces and sustains spiritual life. This light of God is the North Pole to the moral compass of our hearts. 
Without his light shining, illuminating our souls, our hearts are like compasses spinning out in a steel prison. Out of order. No way out. Got to figure out my own way of life. That's the meaning of darkness in this text. This refers not merely to the absence of light, but the presence of evil, death, and decay. When John says the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it, he means the light of God is breaking through the darkness that now covers the world. Evil, death, and decay. Where did all this come from? All this darkness. I know you see it. Even though the sun is up, sure is pretty dark out there, isn't it? Anger, perversion, hostility, violence, darkness across the country, darkness across the world, darkness even in our own hearts. Where'd that come from? Paul goes on in Romans 1 to show that although in creation we can see and know God, we did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but we became futile in our thinking. Our foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, we became fools and exchanged the truth of the glory of God for a lie and worshiped the creature instead of the creator. That's where the darkness comes from. Ourselves. Our pursuit of self-glory. The world tells us there is no creator. Life and light and love, they didn't exist before creation. They came after. First, Creation came, not sure exactly how that happened, but then life and light and love, these things developed over time. We're just a product of primordial slime that developed over a really long time into life. And then animals, and then people. Us. Charles Darwin in his staple on evolution, The Origin of Species, concludes his masterpiece of work with this, saying, Thus, from the war of nature, from famine and death, the most exalted object which we are capable of conceiving, namely the production of the higher animals, directly follows. There is grandeur in this view of life from so simple a beginning. Endless forms, most beautiful, most wonderful, have been and are being evolved. The most exalted object in which we are able to conceive has emerged over time. Humans, the highest of animals, most beautiful, most wonderful. You know what that means? Gloria in excelsis human. Glory to us in the highest. That's the world we live in, is it not? To the world, our pursuit of self-glory, fame, and honor is the most beautiful thing there is. To God, it's the very thing that's wrong with us. It's the cause of darkness, death, and decay. We've walked away from the fountain. Yet our hearts still thirst. We must quench them. So what do we do? We look to creation to satisfy us. 
whether it's our work, our achievement, our advancement, our health, our relationships, reputation, food, drink, our kids, money, possession. These things all exist to draw our attention to the glory of God's loving kindness, His mercy, His goodness, His beauty. But when we look to creation and not the Creator to satisfy our longing for life and light, we ultimately get darkness, deceit. Even if it's sunny, it's a lie. Instead of being full, we remain empty, constantly longing for more, looking for any quench we could get our hands on. Christmas informs us of how to get back to the fount of true life and light. Let's read on. Verses 6 through 8. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The Apostle John introduces John the Baptist now and explains that God sent him as another sign to testify to the reality of the coming of light. This is important. Just as creation testifies to the glory of God, so God has sent messengers to testify to the reality of God's presence, of who he is, and his presence. All the letters in this book, every letter and book that we have in this Bible, is from God's sent ones, his people, his messengers, his, pro- his prophets, testifying to who he is, revealing to the world the reality of his presence. Here, God sends John to prepare the way for Jesus so that when we see him, we would really believe that the light of the world has come. Verses 9 through 13. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So, the true light of God breaks through the darkness. The Word of God is fully revealed. The Son of God, Jesus Christ, comes into the world. God is with us. Merry Christmas. The Creator becomes creation in order to rescue creation, us, from deceit, death, and decay. What more could we ask for? We have no other need. What more is there to ask of God? There's nothing else to wonder. God is physically here. You can touch him. But creation cannot see him. Not even his own people can see him. And they knew what to look for. How is that? How is it possible that we cannot see him? Jesus tells us. Just two chapters later, in John 3, he makes it very clear. Jesus says these words, The light has come into the world, but people love darkness rather than light. People love the darkness. That's why we can't see them. Darkness is blindness. Our loves are disordered. So the compass remains spinning, can't find true north. We become restless, wandering orphans in the world, seeking life and light in all the wrong places, looking to one another for meaning, value, and truth. It's all we got, 
right? It's the best we got. We can only see ourselves. And we've grown accustomed to this way of life, kind of like the Christmas music. It's all we see. Glory to us in the highest. Darwin himself said, we are the most exalted objects that we are capable of seeing. Is that true? Here's a test. If you were to ask a random room of people, not in a church, random room of people out there, this size, what's your favorite thing about Christmas? What do you think the answers will primarily consist of? Oh, the smells, the sweets, the trees, the gifts, the toys, the people, the songs. No. How many would say, oh, easy, the sustained reflection that God is with us. We can't see him. And he's the only reason we have this holiday. But there's good news. There's really good news. Because verse 12, John tells us, not everyone can't see him. To those who want to see him, who believe in him and receive him, to those he gives the privilege to become children of God. This is good. The fountain of life himself has broken into our prison to break us out. He's come for us to rescue us. Can you see him? My wife and I just finished watching the six-part miniseries on uh, World War II on the front lines on Netflix, just released. Maybe some of you are watching that right now. You know as well as I do, when you watch that stuff, some of the most difficult sights to see is when children are being separated from their parents, right? It makes you just want to rise up and jump through that screen, round up those children. You're coming with me. Does, do you not fill with that, family? That's exactly what God feels and does for us. I'm not going to let anyone or anything hold you captive. You're my children. You're my precious creation. I'm coming for you. He breaks into our world, and with one look, our hearts ping. True north has come. And then, life and light bursts through into our souls, born again into a new creation. Not a physical rebirth here. This is new spiritual life. God's Spirit transforming us from lost orphans to adopted children. God's children forever tapped into the fountainhead of life and light, real glory, unceasing. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus says, follow me. I'm breaking you out. That's the Christmas message. It's a rescue story. It's a real life rescue story, and we're living in it tonight. We're in it. Verse 14, final verse. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, the everlasting glory of the Son from the Father. We can see him. And what does his glory look like? Full of grace and truth. Grace and truth overflowing. Life and light. Merry Christmas, humanity. Jesus did not just come to show us life and light. He came to give it to us, to give us himself, never-ending filling of grace and truth and peace and joy. 
satisfaction, overflowing with grace and truth, all together glorious. He came to awaken the spiritually dead and give sight to the blind and lost. Look to him and live is the Christmas message. The same God who said, let there be light, looks at us when we believe in Jesus and says, let there be light, let there be light, let there be light. We become children of light and then move out and spread the light of eternal life throughout the world. What great honor. What great joy. This is what God has done for us at Christmas. God so loved the world, he sent his son into the dark world to rescue us and bring us back into his light. On the cross, Jesus, who knew no darkness at all, took our darkness upon himself though, so that we who believe in him would receive his righteousness, his glory, his peace, his joy, his everlasting life, his death for our life. Amen? That's the great exchange. Greater than any other gift exchange you could imagine. What would you get at your exchange this Christmas? A mug? A puzzle? Rubbish. I can't believe I just said that word. This is the gift of glory. Real glory. To find our honor, value, and satisfaction in him. Communion with God restored. There is no greater gift on the face of the earth to be found. Amen? C.S. Lewis, in his book Miracles, likens God's salvation to a diver that starts in the light, then reduces himself to nakedness, then gone with a splash. He dives deeper and deeper into the dark, cold water. Pressure increases as he enters into the death-like region of ooze, slime, and old decay. He grasps his treasure and then up again quickly, back into color and light, breathing the breath of life once again. He holds high and tight his new precious possession. Us. Us. Isn't it beautiful? That's real glory. The choice is yours. Remain in the dark, seeking the glories of this world, or look to the light and receive him. Receive true glory in him. He who has the Son has life in the light. No matter how dark it gets out there, and it's bound to get darker, the darkness cannot overcome this light. We are safe and satisfied in him. Amen? Glory to God in the highest. Light and life to us on earth. Merry Christmas. Let us pray now, and then we'll close in song. Oh, how precious is your steadfast love, oh God. You've come for us. Thank you, Jesus. For with you is the fountain of life, and in your light do we see light. Fill us this season with life and light as we look to you and receive the hope of glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As the true light has come into the world, so we receive him and spread the light of the glory of Jesus throughout the world.
Silent night, holy night, Son of God, love's pure light. Radiant beams from thy holy face with the dawn of redeeming grace. Merry Christmas. God bless you all. <laughs>